Please stand and let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. And we do appreciate all that you do. And it is about working together in a partnership, as AP said. We are very grateful that all of you are here today. We expected 35 people and look at you. You're beautiful. That's Wilson. <laughs> And that's the kind of support that the Legislative Black Caucus gets. My charge is to talk about the budget overview. And right after I do that, we have Senator Erica Smith Ingram in this order, who's going to talk about education. Then we have Health Care and Human Services by Senator Don Davis. We have Representative Shella Willingham to talk about jobs and community development. And Senator Bryant is going to talk about justice and public safety. And because of the time constraints, we had planned to try to be out of here by 5.30. An executive decision has been made <laughs> for our chair. So we're going to go over and try to get you out at 5.45 or shortly before. So instead of three minutes each, we're asking each presenter to take two minutes, if you would, just two minutes. Well, what about the budget? In the state of North Carolina, there are about six steps that we follow in terms of the budget process. The governor, first of all, proposes a budget for the biennium, which is two years, FY1718 and FY1819. So we're talking two fiscal years. The fiscal year begins July 1 of a given year and ends June 30 of the following year. So the governor proposes a budget. The first chamber, the House or the Senate develops its version of the budget. In this case, this year, the Senate did their first version of the budget. And that is traditional. Uh, each year, every two years, either the House presents the budget first or the Senate. Well, this year it was the Senate. And of course, by tradition, they alternate in doing this lead role. However, I can tell you the Senate version of the budget never agrees with the House. <laughs> so once the Senate did their budget, the House rejected it and did their budget. After the House did their budget, a conference committee had to be formed. Representatives from the House and the Senate come together and there's a conference committee. And that committee reconciled or resolved the differences between the House version of the budget and the Senate version. So that's pretty much how the process works. The last step would be that it goes to the governor for signature. And what if the governor doesn't sign the budget, doesn't agree with it? If he vetoes the budget, then it takes the Senate as well as the House to override his veto. So we are talking three-fifths of the voting members in each chamber. So therein is a nutshell of the budget. Our budget this year for the current year we're in, which started July 1, was fiscal year 2017-18, is $23 billion approximately. In terms of where that money is to be spent, education is $13 billion. Health and Human Services is $5 billion. Then you have Justice and Public Safety with $2.7 billion. And then there are other departments and categories. But if you just listen to the fact that education is 13 billion of the 23 billion, then we know that 57% of our budget goes to education, about 23% goes to health and human services, 12% goes to justice and public safety. So you know where the fight is all about, and the focus is on education and health and human services. So therein is a nutshell of the budget. And I'm going to stop there because you might have questions later. And I think you have a handout on the process and how the budget moves from committee to committee and uh, chamber to chamber. And I'm going to yield now to Senator Erica smith Ingram. As Representative Palmer Butterfield just shared, the bulk of our money is spent on education. If we look at the rundown, um, the appropriation for education was only about 1.82% above the 2008 pre-recession funding. What we saw, um, that were some good things, but not enough. 
If you look at the compensation and benefits, um, teacher average teacher pay raise was about 3.3%, and um, there was an increase for retirees. Finally, retirees got a 1% cost of living adjustment after many, many years, and that is recurring. Um, Non-teaching state employees receive a $1,000 raise. When you look at the teacher increases and bonuses, um, every step got a raise and an increase and a bonus of $385 for 25 plus years of experience. Third, um, assistant principals received about 13.4% over two years in raises and principals received about 8.6%. We were so happy, we fought for um, an increase to deal with the large waiting list we have for pre-K slots. So the budget added five, uh, 3,525 new pre-K slots over two years. Um, our only concern though is the federal money that's tied to that. Um, there are some restrictions, so we're hoping that we can really honor that wait list. Um, it did not include the funding. A lot of you heard a lot about the classroom size. Um, it was HB 13, and we felt that we were in fear that um, many of our specials or enhancement teachers would be lost in the fray um, when we reduced the class size. So it's um, estimated that there's going to be $293 million in additional funding that was not there to make sure that our kids can continue to keep art, PE, and music, which we know is so important in educating the whole child. Um, there was a $11.2 million um, increase in non-recurring funds for textbooks and digital learning, but guess what? That's still 49% below 2010 level spending. Okay, I got a minute, got to hurry up. Um, it added $363 million to the Rainy Day Fund. And so um, it's interesting that we're packing all of that. Now the Rainy Day Fund is about $1.84. Um, yeah, about the $1.85 um, billion. And so we could be using that funding to address shortfalls such as you know broadband expansion. Um, and that's so critical to education. It cut um, personal income tax rates um, from 5.49 to 5.25. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because if we're cutting the money that we're bringing in in revenue, then we're gonna have a shortfall eventually. We won't be able to meet these very important educational needs. Um, we created a voucher program um, called an Education Savings Accounts. And um, that's a form of taxpayer funded $9,000 debit card given directly to parents for educational expenses. And let's not forget the $10 million um, per year to the voucher program increase um, over the next 12 years. And so eventually by 2027, 28, it'll be $144.8 million annually, annually appropriated for the voucher program. Last but not least, it cut NCDPI spending by 6.2%, but yet it gave the state superintendent $700,000 um, $700, for up to 10 new exempt positions with his office, and it kept the report card um, formula at 80%. Achievement, 20% growth, and it switches to a 10-point grading scale beginning in 2019. And I do have to mention, though, we were able to get back the teacher fellows program, but it favors STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics teachers. Um, and so if you have any young people that you can inspire, inspire to go into education, because we're going to have a shortfall because we don't pay our teachers nearly enough. And I'm not saying that because I'm an educator, but teachers make every other profession possible. And so we need to provide that kind of education. All right. Um, health and um, human services, um, and as well as health care. Um, as we were talking before, uh, this is a significant portion of the state's budget, about $5 billion. Um, as well, when we look at uh, where we are as a state, uh, North Carolina ranks um, 32nd in the nation in overall health, um, just as a reference point for us. And now some of the highlights we see uh, with the budget this year. Um, first and foremost, as we heard earlier, uh, we did not get all of the students in terms of our early um, pre-K, early childhood education. Um, we were able to pick up an additional 75% of them, which equates to about 3,525 children. We still have a commitment that was laid out before this state governor to get up to 100%. Um, another thing that's a highlight here in this area 
um, about $18 million, and there was a lot of discussion that went towards the child welfare system um, and how we would address it. Uh, we did avoid regionalization. Uh, we do see additional resources that are actually now um, going and, and um, being, being put in place to support our children here. Uh, one thing that's been a big highlight for many of our organizations, uh, not just the North Carolina Legislative Black Caucus, was raise the age. We have now, North Carolina, we've been the last holdout in the nation. Now we have raised the age, ladies and gentlemen. That's a big deal. Another highlight that you saw, and there were bipartisan efforts that were made uh, to deal with opioids. Um, there was $10 million um, put in the budget to help um, address this matter. And what we understand um, is, is the approach in the method is dealing with treatment. I would say in summary, um, I tend to still hear that we need to be mindful of how we address other substances of choice. So I'm going to simply say this, you know, it's something that's on the radar screen, but if we have to look at a model, the one thing that stands out in this model is the treatment aspects of it. Another thing that I would highlight, and this is, I think, really um, important, especially in eastern North Carolina, when we look at rural health, uh, there are grant programs that's been put in place um, that communities can apply to access um, rural health initiatives. Another thing I will highlight, two other, and these are kind of just some favorites I want to talk about, and I'm not going to hit on everything today, but um, the state picked up the Dolly Parton Imagination Library Initiative. Now, this is really important. Uh, my wife, Green County, she's actually director of the Pre-K Center, and she's the Dollywood coordinator for the county. And what this does in summary is get books out to all of our children. So the state now has actually picked this up so that we can get and begin um, at the earliest ages of actually mailing books out uh, to children. And then the last thing I'll speak, out, uh, speak on here is the Healthy Food Small Retail Program. This is something, um, it was a bill that I sponsored, um, working with Representative Holly in the House. Um, the, found they, uh, the caucus picked up and endorsed and it was based on a model in Bethel, and in summer, what we're able to do is work with health departments to try to get more fruits and vegetables into our corner stores um, across the state. So that will conclude in, um, in summary on um, health and human services. The one thing that I would mention before I pass the mic that I think is the, probably the biggest thing that I could ever say, and I did see the sign earlier, um, <laughs> We have to continue talking about Medicaid expansion. Yes. There's no way, no way, that we can afford not to have that conversation. There was a proposal of a Carolina Cares that rolled out um, some version of a, a program. Um, but at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, we hear the conversations taking place in Washington. We hear the conversations taking place in North Carolina. And this is what I would simply say, whether it is Obamacare, Trump care, Carolina care, people want to know that we stay in the fight and that somebody cares for them. Thank you. This uh, past session, when it comes to jobs and community development, there was nothing done. There was very little done. The, the major thing I think that happened was that we did uh, uh, reinstate uh, JDIG and that's job development, industrial development. Uh, and I can speak personally from that because uh, the last term we had, uh, the Republicans were arguing about J.D. or not doing it. And uh, in Edgecombe County, we probably lost two major companies that we could have gotten because of that. So we're talking about we had uh, companies that was ready to invest uh, a half a billion dollars, but they decided not to go because uh, we did not have any kind of uh, policy as it relates to economic development. So I, I think that's the biggest thing. And most of the money, uh, normally I think uh, even whatever development we're going to have, it's been going toward uh, the uh, hurricane disaster. As you, you're probably aware, uh, you know, we just put another 100 
million dollars into the program, and we've already put a hundred million dollars or over a hundred million, hundred and fifty uh, million dollars, uh, and we'll be putting more in there. But the excuse is that most of the money is going to uh, the disaster program. But just as Senator Erica mentioned, you know, for our rainy day fund, we have close to two billion dollars, close to that. So why, it's raining now, so why not use that money to take care of those <laughs> things? So, so again, as far as creating jobs or doing things to create jobs, uh, I don't know of any legislation that we had uh, that I can point to and say this was done to create jobs or something that is creating jobs. So that's one of the areas that we will be focusing on too in, in the future. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Wilhelm said I can have the folks together. Can you have time? Um, justice and public safety, I think we already mentioned raising the juvenile justice age um, to uh, six, well, 17, effective uh, December 2019, which means there are still two years we have to ramp up and plan for that. So you want to stay in touch with what's happening with your juvenile justice administrators administrators, and, and I use juvenile justice system as they ramp up and get ready for that um, process and there's planning money in place. In addition to that, I was fortunate to be the co-sponsor of a bill that modified the state's expunction policy, one of the biggest modifications we've had since we started it, yeah, which took 15 years of a clean record to get a chance to expunge one conviction and you can only have one expunged. Now we've reduced that waiting period to 10 years for felonies, five years for misdemeanors, which will make it more eligible, more people eligible for it. And this is for uh, nonviolent felonies um, and uh, a certain set list of offenses. And um, in addition to that, we've created a standard process for expunction, so there'll be forms in the clerk's office that you fill out, it'll be the same process in every county and a set process for the court officials to go through in order to get you the expunction. And what really helped us be able to get this modification is we are allowing the district attorneys a look back. If, if a person reoffends, they do get to look back at your prior conviction. So your expunction is only good so long as you don't have another offense. So it is still very restricted. It's your first offense, and you cannot have another offense. But for that period of time, you are eligible for the expunction. What we do urge you to do is get involved. We also were able to get um, repeat, um, get um, funding for our local reentry council to continue its work. We need all of you to get involved and learn about reentry work. In addition to expunctions, we have something called certificates of relief. There are several options available for offenders now to help them get back to work and back uh, re back reentered into society. And there are organizations, including the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, the, the, um, the Justice Center, the Second Chance Alliance, and our local reentry council are there to help provide services to offenders to help them get um, back into um, uh, back into society. I think that is the major um, issue that I want that I would want to raise under justice and public safety. So very we want good. To, very good. Now we have questions from you all in the back. Yes. My question is uh, for the reentry program: Is there a list of uh, jobs available for uh, individuals to uh, get? I know that I'm in Nash County. Would that be at the need? building, because I go to quite a few of those meetings. And I think this is, and you raised an important question, and that this was the other point I wanted to make. I am asking our local government officials, particularly our city council leaders, to sort of get your hands into this reentry piece. Because if we don't get the program working more effectively, and ultimately I think we're gonna have to get local government ownership of this program to continue the funding, that, uh, we do, the reentry council should be uh, keeping an updated list of offender-friendly employers and what the options are. 
for offenders. And so uh, I don't know where they are locally in that process, but it, yeah. I just want to uh, reiterate that Red Stone actually has a program that individuals can go to Edge Home Community College, take this course to help them to understand tire manufacturing and everything. Mm -hmm. And that's one company that I know that do hire individuals that does have a um, criminal background. Thank you. I just want to let you know, my name is Gary Creeches. This is, uh, um, I represent District 7, which is the heart of the district right here at Wilson Community College. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Just want to let you know that I am the, uh, on the entry, entry program, and I am the chair, uh, vice chair of it. My problem is with the young men that I've been working with is that uh, the funding mm -hmm. has been a big problem because you make promises to individuals and then you, you find out that they don't have any money, then these guys are going back again on some other things. My biggest problem uh, that uh, I'm trying to alleviate is to make sure that these young men, there are some great young men who have some problems. And we try to overcome that. But the reentry program here at Wilson, which is very, is new, but we're still trying to find ways to help the individuals. Now, I didn't know. I'm, I'm glad I found a little bit about you that you're working with the individuals so I know who to come to when I need something, right? But when, since you said that the local officials, I'm going to let you know I've been involved with young men for a long time. And, oh, but, but it's the structure that we need to look at. The funding now goes to the department who makes a contract with a nonprofit mm -hmm. to manage the program. In the current political environment, that is a difficult structure to add more funding to mm -hmm. because it's just kind of fuzzy, wasn't it? So, but if the, so if the local government, one of the local governments in three counties would host it, Mm -hmm. are looking to only be taking responsibility, I think it would be easier for us to advocate and get that funding. That's just my opinion. Yeah. I don't know if the other, you all agree? Yeah, because yeah. I'm in the house they work on. Thank you. Yes, uh, we have a question over here. The gentleman with the blue on, please. Yes. Okay. We'll come back to you. Yes, thank you. Senator Brown, I, I want to thank you very much for the work you've done on the expungement stuff. So I'm long overdue. And, uh, I think it's going to bear much fruit for society. One thing that I observed when I was reading through the law that kind of struck me as something you might need to go revisit has to do with expungements for people who have been found not guilty. I kind of have a hard time wrapping my head around that you got to go to apply to the court to get them to verify that you've been found not guilty. I, I wonder if you could go back and those records should be expunged automatically upon a finding of not guilty or dismissal of the law. And those bills were filed. We, this was a carefully negotiated yeah, arrangement to get what we got, but that is the next step, both in a not guilty and also the people found innocent yeah. from the Innocence yeah. Commission and uh, these other efforts. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, speaking, and even, a part, even if you get pardoned, you got to get it exposed. Oh, yeah, and I'm just absolutely crazy to know that. Now, here's something else I want to get you to look at. It's on that same oh, thing. Okay. Okay, is the fact that when somebody is found innocent by the Innocent Commission, they don't have access to the reentry resources that a, a convicted felon would have. They're just dismissed and thrown out on the street to do it however they can. And I don't think that's right either. I think you should make them eligible for being able to get the same services as somebody that's convicted. They do get large financial settlements. Well, but that may be a year down the road after yeah, they the street. Yeah, that's the problem. Okay. Council, Thanks very much. Councilman Coleman. All of us need high-speed internet in this state, especially our young people. Mm -hmm. You think we would ever? Do you think we would ever? Do you think we would get it during my lifetime uh, to have Wilson expand that green light beyond Wilson County? Um. Now, to me, it's simple. If if private says that thing, make them do it or allow us to do it. It needs to be done. Let me say this to you before uh, Senator Bryant speaks. Some bills are marathons and some are sprints, as you know. And this is going to be a long-term project that's going to have to really be worked on. And we need the deeds in charge in Rome. The Democrats need some control. Oh, yeah, I think if, you, if we get a Democratic uh, majority, both in, in Washington 
and here. then here you might have a chance. But right now, the private providers have a lockdown. You know, they there is this antagonism toward municipal enterprise operations of any kind. You know, and particularly internet. I did want to mention on the economic development front, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the expansion, the extension of the JMAC funding That's for right. Bridgestone Firestone. That's that right. was probably one of the major accomplishments major for us we made this year to get a, uh, the extension of that additional funding for them on the condition that they will continue to expand and make million dollars of investments and stay, keep their 2,000 employees. And that's here in Florida to Wilson County. Hi, Erin. Yes, I also wanted to share with you as well, um, Representative Susan Martin in the House and um, myself and Senator Deanna Ballard, we filed the bill that would allow Greenlight to continue to serve, provide service and internet service to Pine Tops and the farm in Nash County. And that's so important for them to be able to continue that service, but also receive the compensation. But there are so many regulations in place and federal regulations, FCC, that forbid that kind of anti-competition component about it. But I'm with you 100%. As we move more to digital learning and also even to compete globally with economic development, we have got to make sure every nook and cranny of eastern North Carolina, rural parts of western North Carolina, this entire state is um, connected through broadband access and internet access. So we definitely are going to continue to fight for that. Any other questions? One last burning question, all the way in the back. This is the last one. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Edwin Langston. Um, I'd like to know the purpose for starting the sale of alcohol earlier on Sunday morning. What was the purpose for passing that? More money. <laughs> Make money. I didn't go. Um, <laughs> you want to speak? Okay. That, that's an interesting question. Uh, matter of fact, I had a conversation with some people yesterday about that. But here's, here's the thing. Uh, this is, this was a kind of a um, compromise between that and doing something else. Okay. And the idea is that allowing the sale of alcohol one hour, two hours earlier, it was not going to change anything. It's really not going to change anything. But to, uh, to get that, then one of the other things that was in the bill was to have North Carolina to be able to sell alcohol over the internet in our state like that, which we killed. Uh, and this was kind of like one of those compromises uh, for that not to happen. And, and the idea was that the early sale two hours is, is not going to make that much difference. But there was a lot of concern, and I, let me remind you too that when you start talking about alcohol, there are a lot of the, the alcohol industry, uh, they have a lot of um, lobbyists there, a lot of money was spent to even get what they got in this case. And so uh, that's why it happened. Okay. And, and keep in mind also, it's a local option. It's up to the local government to decide if they're going to do it or not. Uh, we had a gentleman that had a question about veterans and disabled veterans. Can we hear from you, sir? My question was, there was a house bill too that was bought the thing for the 100 percent veteran, disabled veterans to get tax exempt from 45 moved up to 100 percent. Well, then the house had voted it uh, unanimously and come down to the Senate and had nothing heard about it, hadn't heard it from it anymore. So I was trying to call you, call all of everybody, trying to find out whether it would be brought back, amended, or what. Okay. That that can happen. It can pass the House, but not pass the Senate, and it might be held up in committee, but it can be looked into. Don, Senator Davis? Yeah. Let me say on behalf of the caucus, I want to first um, commend you for your service. And yes. we'll ask if all of our veterans that are here, if you can stand, and we want to just briefly recognize anyone who's serving on United States Armed Services. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Don, you can stand also. <laughs> Let me share that you're correct. The, the bill uh, moved in the House. However, it, it has not gotten the same um, progress and momentum in the Senate yet. It's not necessarily dead. 
Um, but what I would emphasize, um, what you see that came out of the Senate um, is we pushed a bill through that would actually exempt retirement pay of our military um, who are serving in the state of North Carolina, who have been in the North Carolina and living in North Carolina. So what we're doing right now, there's a lot of efforts that's been made to sort through the, you know, how we're going to take care of veterans who are serving our country. I don't think that's gone. Right, thank, thank you, Don. Thank you. Thank you. I, I do want to say that um, you have some really hardworking legislators here today, and they have made a difference. And if re-elected and kept in line with their districts or changed in their districts and they're re-elected, you will have some very committed, dedicated elected officials in the North Carolina House. And I'm proud to be a part of the North Carolina Legislative Black Caucus because of people like this. <laughs> the final thing I wanted to mention was we have a committee to help work on this to make this successful. Uh, Senator Bryant, I didn't do all the work by ourselves, so would you all please stand and be recognized? Everybody to help make this a success that came today and worked on this project. Please stand, all of you. The greeters, everybody, yes, all of you. All of you stand. Don't be bashful, Democratic women, <laughs> aka Delta. <laughs> Democratic women make the girl world go around. That's right. And then Farmer Bernhill. Let the people says has an announcement. But I also, before that, I wanted to thank uh, Governor Hunt and Mrs. Hunt. You know, it's not every day that you get a former governor in the audience in the town hall meeting. So, we're really pleased. And I want to thank all of the elected officials who came to support what we're doing and to ask questions and make sure that we're on point in terms of priorities for this area. Thank you so much. And finally, I want to thank Wilson Tech. Every time we've asked them about using the facility, it's been done. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you can use this facility. All you gotta do is ask. And they do an excellent job of coming in, setting up what we need, and making sure that our events are successful. And I want to thank Wilson Chet for this, okay? Thank you. Just want to acknowledge that we have uh, another member of the governor's team here today. If Henry Lancaster, if you stand up, please. And let us know. <laughs> he is the Region 1 liaison for Hurricane Matthew Recovery. Henry, what counties are you serving now? Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Nash, Wilson, Martin, Bertie, and Pitt. Thank you for being here. But really, Yes. Find anybody you need to, please. And Linda, did you have an announcement? Yes, I did. Okay. Wilson County, let's give them all a big hand clap of hands again. Thank you, panelists, for being here and sharing all this information with us. It's going to take all of us. So therefore, Saturday, the second Saturday in each month at 9.30 at the Public Library, we invite all of you to come and be a part of the Democratic Party meetings. We need you because it's going to take all of us to move forward in Wilson County and to make a big, big difference in this state. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Bryant, we cannot close without you. Okay, well, Last comment, closing comments. Spring fling. Somebody told me you have spring fling. Oh, yes, we have, uh, <laughs> yes, we have, <laughs> yes, we have, we have our major fundraiser. The Democratic Party is having their fall fling. It's Thursday, September the 21st from 6 to 9 p.m. and it's going to be located at something different. So therefore we invite all of you, the tickets are $50, you can be a sponsor at various levels. So please see me, Beth, raise your hand real high for me please. Uh, Beth Ponte, but, but um, and one of the things that we're working on now is to, if you're not on our, our mailing list to receive the announcements, then therefore please see me, uh, see one of the officers, raise your hands officers, Wherever you may be, offices hands high. Please so that we'll, you'll be on the mailing list and check the newspapers also for the announcements for those persons who are not tech, tech savvy. So again, thank you. And I just want to join uh, Representative Farmer Butterfield and thanking all of you for coming out and thanking all of our members for supporting us. Y'all are awesome. And thanking Anita Earls. She is amazing. And your whole, she has an organization behind her. And thank all of you.
thank our media friends. We hope they'll be friendly. Don't tell them what they'll say about us, but we love them anyway. We know it'll be real news, whatever it is. So thank you for coming. Be blessed and travel safely until we meet again. Oh, goodness.